Hello, everyone. I'm Another View producer Lisa Godley in for Barbara Ham Lee. Bordered by three popular Portsmouth roadways, Portsmouth Boulevard, Deep Creek Boulevard, and Frederick Boulevard, sits the 100-year-old community of Truxton. Founded by the United States government as a township in 1919, Truxton was the first wartime housing project constructed exclusively for African-American shipyard workers and their families. In just a few minutes, we'll explore Truxton's rich history with some of the people who know it well. It's an Another View history lesson right after this. Discussing today's topics from an African-American perspective, this is Another View. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Another View. I'm Another View producer, Lisa Godley, filling in for Barbara Ham Lee. Well, I've traveled in and out of the Truxton section of Portsmouth, Virginia, my entire life. For decades, my parents would drive through Truxton on the way to my grandparents' home in Brighton, Throughout her career, my mom, Lizzie Godley, taught at three schools, all within about a mile of Truxton, Douglas Park, Emily Spong, and Highland Biltmore. I also remember that on Sunday afternoons, on the way home from church, we would always stop at High's Ice Cream Shop in Truxton for a treat. But it wasn't until earlier this week, when I started researching this 100-year-old community, that I discovered the amazing history of how Truxton came about. Joining me to help tell this incredible story are three Truxton natives, Horace Savage, Ann Gordine, and James Overton. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Well, thank thank you. you for being here. Thank Thanks you for having us. <laughs> also joining our panel, former Portsmouth Mayor Kenneth Wright, whose wife grew up in Truxton and who has done extensive research on this historic community. Welcome, Kenneth. Thank you. Now, if you'd like to be a part of this discussion, give us a call at 440 440- 2665 or 1 800 940 2240. Now, Kenny, I'm going to start with you yes, so that you can explain how all this came about. Now, I want to start at the very beginning with the federal government's decision to build two communities, one black and one white, both designed to provide housing for shipyard workers during World War I. Correct. Yeah, well, they decided, and actually they came and tried to find land in close proximity, naturally, of the Navy Yard, and uh, okay. they got two parcels, one for the town of Craddock and one for the town of Truxton. Craddock was developed and built a year prior to Truxton in 1918. 1919 is when Truxton came online, and because of race relations and things at that time, they had to make sure that they didn't want to create and make matters worse from that standpoint. So they made sure that both properties were evenly split and distance away from each other, that they both, the black and the white workers, could get in and out of the shipyard. And that really crossed paths coming to and from work. And so the town of Truxton is located right on what is now Portsmouth Boulevard. But uh, uh, they they developed about 40 acres. I think it's a total of maybe about 80 acres, but about 43 acres of it was the development. And uh, um, you got to understand the whole piece with trying to find a place for blacks back during that time was created out of the war. Because of World War One. a lot of the immigrants that normally came into this country, it came to almost a halt. And so the country was faced with major labor shortages and Congress and everybody else was trying to figure out how do we, how do we fill this gap, so to speak. And for some reason, they never thought of using black workers. And that idea came up and from that created this huge surge of how do we convince black people and get them to support the war effort? And how do we bring this all in to be able to help a numerous of things? Because remember, during the same time as the war was what was considered in the black communities as the great migration from around 1913 to 1920. Blacks were leaving, fleeing the South and moving into the North and in industrialized states for better housing, jobs, and things of that nature. And so it created a huge problem in the country from a manpower standpoint. You had the Southern 
farmers and folks that were fearful of the fact that they're losing all of these all this labor, cheap labor, and they were moving north. And then the government all of a sudden wanted to get in on the labor piece because of the war. And they had these shortages. So they had all of these industrial plants over around the country that had labor shortages. So they all of a sudden wanted to use black labor. And then you had the industrial plants up in the north and that were looking for workers. And so there was a huge cry for labor and Black men were of a high commodity for once in this country's history. (laughs) And uh, so that started the whole, wow, we need to do something here. And uh, and how do we do it? Well, I would imagine these types of houses were very attractive to to people coming up whether they were were farm laborers or because you you had electricity oh, you absolutely. had running water it was you know, the first it was the it was the, the the pristine it was the cream of the crop so to speak this development that was built to attract these black workers here it was running water electricity the whole nine yards i mean they had uh communities with front yards backyards gardens the whole nine yards it was uh it was it was widely advertised throughout the country but the government still couldn't get their arms around how do we convince black people to come here? How do we convince black people to support the war effort? And they couldn't decide. And so they went out and approached the NAACP, the Urban League, and a lot of other organizations like them trying to get their arms around this whole issue. And so they decided in 1916, I believe, or 1915, to create in the Department of Labor a Department of Negro Economics. And that was very interesting. That department only lasted for about three years because the, because of segregation and all of those other things. There were a lot of people opposed to that. This was during the President Wilson administration. And uh, so anyway, they created a Department of Negro Economics and they asked a professor from Fish University named Professor Haynes to head that organization up. As a matter of fact, he was handpicked by W.E.B. Du Bois and uh, Evan Post, who was uh, uh, the Assistant Secretary of Labor for the Woodrow Wilson administration. And so that f- that created this organization. And what they did, Lisa, is they created a network through the South and about 11 states. They created what they call Negro Advisory Committees. And they tried to bring white and black people together to be able to talk about the labor issues and all of the other things they needed to be able to just to create a network because black people that were in the South were looking to move in other areas, but they didn't know where. They didn't know what jobs. It wasn't like there was a board or the Internet where you could say, oh, in Ohio, they're looking for somebody. So this Negro Advisory Committee that was put together throughout the country became very successful for the federal government. And it was all the brainchild of uh, Professor Haynes. Okay, now when they built Truxton, Mm -hmm. they originally wanted, they had, the idea was to have like shops, a theater, yeah. Um, it was a whole bunch of different little, um, it was supposed to be, I think it originally was designed to have 35 stores. They had grand plans. Right. You got to remember the other thing with Truxton is right during the construction and the, 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 the early on of the grand plans, the war ended. Okay. And with the ending of the war came a whole lot of other dynamics that they didn't encounter. And so they never developed the, the community. And as a matter of fact, they started hand layoffs in the Navy Yard. I, there was a contract, there was a ship, the USS North Carolina, that was under construction, and they halted work, and they had a layoff of about 4,000 people. Wow. So that town went from being stood up, bringing all these people in, trying to advertise and get these folks in, and then all of a sudden the war effort ends. There's a massive resistance from Southern whites, they call them Dixiecrats, that was trying to kill the whole thing. And so they killed this Department of Negro Economics by defunding it in 1922, I believe it was. They didn't even tell the Department of Labor. They just defunded it now, in is the that next about, budget cycle. Is that about the time that Portsmouth annexed? 
the uh, town of two Truxton? years later, po- okay. Portsmouth annexed Truxton in 1923. Okay. But when they first built the town, they opened the town up in May of 1919. They had already talked about turning Truxton and Craddock over to the city of Portsmouth because near the end of the war, they were trying to get back to what they call a sense of normalcy. And so they were trying to de fun or um, get out of this business of housing and doing what they had done. And so there was a huge effort on the government's part to get out of it. And so they went to the nearby town or city, which was Portsmouth, and approached them about taking over the town of Truxton. And Craddock, the town uh, that was built for whites, was uh, uh, a pure chaotic when it came to uh, getting along with each other and all of those things. Not black and white. This was white and white. And so Truxton was easier to annex because it was in the city limits. Mm-hmm. And it was right there. It had the sewer system and everything was connected right there with Portsmouth. And so it made it easier to do that. But they had some challenges as well with who would own the property, the streets, the police, and all of that. Remember, this town of Truxton was a sustaining itself its own town it taxed its own self to pay for its own schools its own teacher salary the principals the police to pay the light bill to keep the lights on in the town the whole nine yards it was it was interesting which is why i got into researching it because think of creating a brand new community right. and bringing these people from all over the country to settle here and somebody had to pull it together. Somebody had to have a sense of community, and you needed leaders and all. And they brought this town manager in, a black fella from Minnesota named F.D. McCracken. The F.D. stood for Frederick Douglass McCracken. His parents named him after Frederick Douglass. He was the first black town manager, and he got with the folks that settled there originally, and they created a town council, and they split the town of Truxton up into districts almost like a ward system Uh and they built what you'll hear these people here talk (laughs) about it's just phenomenal to be able to do something like that in 1919 and do it with such great success and as you hear their stories they'll talk about all of these clubs and organizations and things that they did that was uh uh now I'm gonna fast forward just a little bit the government won it out, sure. so they sold it to some African-American businessmen. Yeah. They put it up for bid, and there was quite a few folks that bid it on it, but there were three black men that won the bid in, in 1924. For $141,000, it was three black gentlemen that purchased the whole town. W.H.C. Brown, he was an attorney. Uh, Dr. A. Strong, he was a medical doctor. And then Dr. Norman Lassiter was a dentist. And those three gentlemen put together a package. And at that time, it was lauded <laughs> as the biggest deal ever by colored people in Tidewater. Wow. So, wow. Uh, <laughs> and they sold the homes to those who were renting Absolutely. them from the government. See, the okay. government tried to do it initially on. There were some initial folks that the government were trying to sell the houses to, and it did not work. The government was just not good at doing that, and that was one of the reasons why they were trying to divest out of it. And with the ending of the war and the layoffs in the shipyard, they went through a time period where there were people that couldn't pay their mortgages, and and the interest and penalties and all of that. And so they were having some real issues with that. And so they wanted just out of it. And so they wanted to put the whole town up for auction, for sale, and get out of the business. And these three black gentlemen bought it for $141,000. They immediately went to all of the citizens there, offered them a 25% discount for what the houses back then were going for about $1,800 to $2,500. And so they offered them a 25% discount to everyone that was renting and staying in the houses. And and then they put it out to the normal public. And so there were other citizens from all over Portsmouth and other areas that were coming to Truxton because they wanted this sweet deal. Okay. And so, yeah, they were able to do that. And Mr. Savage, your family bought a house in Truxton. Yes. <clears throat> and what, what, what decade? When did, when did that take place? Well... As I have heard many times, uh, my grandfather, uh, Thomas Tucker, was one of the first families to move into Truxton. Uh, 
history that I've heard tells me that uh, Mr. Robert Hester was the first family to move into Truxton, uh, and my grandfather was the second, uh, and they were two doors apart. And uh, the house that my father had, where my family lived, was between Mr. Hester and my grandfather's house. So we were close together. Okay. Now you, as a young man, grew up and you worked at the shipyard. Yeah, I worked in the shipyard. So what was that like, that walk every day to go from Truxton to the I, shipyard? I didn't walk. I rode my bicycle. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I went into the Navy Yard when I was 16 years of age. Um, I heard that the Navy Yard was hiring and uh, they you didn't have to put your age up. Normally, uh, the hiring age at the shipyard was 18 years. And all of a sudden, uh, this rumor goes around town that uh, the labor board is hiring and you don't have to put your age up. So I had just graduated from Norcom uh, in the midterm class of 1942. And... Uh, I went to the shipyard, uh, got hired as a classified laborer in the paint shop. Uh, so uh, at that time, uh, I was scheduled to enroll in Hampton Institute. Um, I had been accepted and my mother had made preparations for me to go. But when I went to work in the shipyard, I told her, no, I'm not going to Hampton. And I intended to change all the plans for that. So I stopped doing anything that contributed towards <laughs> preparation for me to go to Hampton. So... Uh, I uh, I just stopped. I wouldn't do anything to prepare to go to Hampton. But she kept on, and I told her, Mama, you need to just stop doing all of this because I'm not going. Um, what I didn't know was that she was conferring with some other folk and uh, I, I had no idea, but she was always very <coughs> self-contained. She didn't seem to get angry with me about my position, and I never could figure out why. But at any rate, when time came for me to go to Hampton, the morning that I was scheduled to go to Hampton, she said, are you going to Hampton this morning? I said, no, ma'am, I'm going to work. And I did that. I got on my bicycle and I rode to the Navy Yard. When I got ready to check in, the leading man came to me and said, oh, Savage, don't you bother about checking in this morning. Uh, the shopmaster wants to see you, so go up to see Mr. Watson. Well, I'm beginning to wonder What's going on? What I've done. Uh, so I go up to Mr. Watson's office. Oh, yeah, Savage, come on in. And his attitude was so celebratory. Oh, he was overjoyed. <laughs> come on in. Glad to see you. Uh, he said, congratulations. You've been placed on education leave. <laughs> I said... Uh, Mr. Watson, I didn't apply for education leave. He said, I know you didn't. Your mother did. <laughs> she went to the admiral. Well, I had no idea that my mother knew how to get in the shipyard, let alone get to the admiral. So he had all of these papers already. He had my check uh and he said, this discharge is 
without prejudice, you will be able to come back in the summer and thereafter if you want to. So uh, I was totally dejected. I wanted to stay in the shipyard. So I went back home and I said, Mama, why did you do this to me? <laughs> and she said, I'm not ready for you to take over full responsibility for the family at this time. And what I found out was that she was always so contained and so tolerant of my refusal to cooperate that I, I just couldn't fathom. But what I found out was that she had consulted with her pastor, uh, Reverend Harvey Johnson Sr., who was a pastor of Ebenezer Baptist Church And at the who, time. by the way, was the architect who yeah. built the Adams <laughs> right. Theater in Norfolk. That's yeah. right. <clears throat> and uh, he uh, 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 talked to uh, Mr. Jeremiah Green, who was the chairman of his deacon board at the time. Mr. Green uh, worked in the shipyard, and uh, they were the two who arranged for Made my sure mother you went to, to have a conference with the admiral. <laughs> so uh, I thought it was very amusing uh, because, first of all, my mother, uh, I just had no capacity to uh, figure out what she was doing. And it all uh, proved to me that... Uh, uh, who was boss? That's right. Uh, it's mom. It's always mom. Yeah. Now, okay, you went to Hampton. You finished Hampton. Yeah. Um, what were other people in the community doing in terms of jobs? Other people in church in Truxton were they also working mm, at yes. the shipyard, or were they going to school? What was what was going on? Yeah. Well, uh, the shipyard was a, a prime source of employment. The Naval Ammunition Depot, which was located near the shipyard, right next to the shipyard, uh, there were those who worked at the naval base. Uh, there were several uh, mail carriers in Truxton. Uh, Truxton had it housed its share of school teachers. Uh, the Procter & Gamble Soap Manufacturing Company had a plant located just behind the Navy Yard on Elm Avenue, and uh, people who lived in Truxton were employed there. So uh, those were the primary sources of employment uh, for people in Truxton. Okay. All righty. If you're just joining us, we're exploring the history of Portsmouth's Truxton community, which turns 100 years old this year with Truxton natives, Horace Savage and Gordine, and James Overton, and former Portsmouth Mayor Kenny Wright, who has done extensive research on the history of the community. I'm Another View producer, Lisa Godley, filling in for Barbara Ham Lee. Please join the conversation if you have Truxton stories at 440-2665 or 1-800-940-2240. James, I'm coming to you next. What yes. are your generations have passed now since uh, Mr. Savage was, was a young man working at the shipyard and... Yes. and your, your family is, is now in Truxton. What do you remember yes, about well, Truxton? I came along in the late 50s. And, and I must say, uh, sitting here listening to, to Kenny's in-depth uh, research <laughs> in Truxton <laughs> and uh, listening to Coach Savage talk about his time in Truxton renews my sense of pride in Truxton because 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 of the rich history and, and, and how far that goes back and, and what was going on during that time. But uh, I'll get to the point uh, where in the 60s was the time I realized about the neighborhood uh the neighborhood village concept that Truxton had. Uh, one of the things, I, I will say this too, the area I lived in was called Acadia Heights. It was a part of Truxton. Uh, originally, it was going to be called West Truxton. But they already had a North Truxton and, of course, Truxton. Wow. Okay. So to sort of break up that that uh, use of the word Truxton, they uh, named three streets, 
Acadia Heights. So, and it was kind of an advantage and sometimes a disadvantage being Acadia Heights and Truxton because we kind of used it interchangeably. Uh, it depends on what neighborhood we were in. Uh, <laughs> some neighborhoods were kind of territorial. And if we were in a neighborhood that didn't favor Truxton, we said we were from Acadia Heights. Gotcha. <laughs> <laughs> and if we wanted to sort of... Uh, sort of have a good reputation in some neighborhoods we said Truxton but you know it was just a neighborhood that was uh, full of family values and and they mentioned about uh, the different occupations that were there and it to me it was still a self-sustaining neighborhood because we had uh, carpenters we had uh, bricklayers we had plumbers and everything we really didn't have to go outside of the neighborhood to get some work done and, and, and at a good price, of course. And it was just a tight knit neighborhood and it was nothing for me to come home to my house and see two or three teachers <laughs> from, my, from my school sitting in there uh, in the living room. Wow. Uh, yeah, and that was kind of intimidating sometimes because some, <laughs> some of them were my teachers. <laughs> uh-huh. But that's the, the circle my parents ran in. And my father didn't actually wasn't born in Truxton. He came to Truxton as a young uh, up-and-coming lawyer and moved to Truxton. And just my experiences there, uh, I I will never, never, ever forget And uh, to the point where I moved back to the neighborhood. And I'm living there now and uh, trying to make sure that the neighborhood remains vibrant and uh, part of the Civic League and make sure that that we just can continue and continue sharing the history of this, this great neighborhood. A hundred years, that's, that's significant. That is very significant, yes. absolutely. And Well, I grew up in Truxton. I'm the <laughs> youngest of seven children. They <clears throat> were all um, above the charts. Um, Truxton is a homogeneous neighborhood. People talk diversity. Truxton is homogeneous. We have... Well, I'll talk about the hats. We had all of the professions they're talking about. We had bakers, caterers. There's a caterer still in existence now. Seamstresses. And even on up the line, not to mention the teachers, but we had the doctors, the lawyers, um, all of the trades. You're absolutely correct. And when I grew up, I played hard. Hopscotch, (laughs) jacks, jumping ropes, um... Uh, I even played marbles. Because of my clumsiness, I couldn't do baseball and basketball. Now, the school in Truxton, I grew up on Manly Street, I think is one of the main streets in Truxton, uh, which was down the street from Truxton Elementary School. Uh, We could walk to school, and the meals were homemade, uh, really God and fresh, talking about organic. Uh, The teachers knew you, and as a matter of fact, you go from elementary school, Truxton, you go to the junior high, and then I call him Coach Savage. He mentioned Norcom. So when they had freedom of choice, I bolted. I didn't go to Craddock to get a better education. I went to Craddock to get away from the excellence that our schools demanded. (laughs) <laughs> really? <laughs> oh my goodness. I was sick of it. My sister Ruth was an artist. My sisters Wilfried and Julia were scientists and mathematicians. My brothers were scientists. And I just got tired of the comparison. Well, you're not good in science. You're not good in math. So I basically So jumped you became an attorney. From the, <laughs> the black sheep of the family. So I jumped from the frying pan and but back to Truxton. Um, the neighbors protected you. Um, it wasn't so much when you were bad, they reported you. It was a protection that prepared you for the biggest world. Um, the buses that came through, we didn't sit in the back of the bus because we were all black customers riding on our route. Um <clears throat> The children. Now, what was the time frame with the bus thing? This was the sixties. Yes. Uh-huh. Okay. All right. Uh, going on, we had Girl Scouts, we had Boy Scouts. Um, if, as the gentleman had talked about, if there's anything you needed, it was right there in Truxton. I never felt discriminated against. I never felt that there were things in this world I was missing, because all of 
everything you needed was right there in our neighborhood. Uh, the school was nearby. The churches were nearby. Now, um, Coach Savage remembers a generation of uh, businesses in yeah, the neighborhood. I was about to ask him to go back through what businesses do he remember. All righty. Well, I'll let him regress once I talk about <laughs> we had a convenience store. It was Jones's convenience store. We had Tankers, the gas station. We had Moore's, the shoe cobbler. We also... <laughs> Somebody made shoes from... from a uh, shoe cobbler. Um, he more of a shoe repairman. Shoe repairs, okay. Uh, it was a dry cleaner, and of course, I mentioned the seamstresses and the elementary school fostered excellence in everyone. Aside from the academics, there were talent shows, and the talent shows were fully attended to. We had. Um, Homemade costumes, the set designs, we had the singers, the dancers, all of which I, I was the best audience there. But <laughs> why aren't you good at this and why aren't you good? But we were exposed to all of those disciplines as a child, and we could explore whatever we wanted. Um, today we talk about hidden figures, Katherine Johnson. We had all of the Katherine Johnsons all around us in our neighborhoods. We had in our schools, in our churches. And I never felt um, that I couldn't do anything. Anything I wanted to do, I did. If I wanted to go over Niagara Falls, my father would say, oh, I know a man who makes those barrels. And the <laughs> barrel maker may be down the neighborhood from me. My mother was a, a homemaker. Um, during the time, a man could support a family. And he supported a family of nine, seven children wow, and two adults. Mm -hmm. And um, um, I get choked up just talking about all of the advantages and the um, <clears throat> trust. The neighbors trusted each other. We would go on trips. Um, well, we particularly traveled up and down the green. Um, I'm thinking about the green uh, book. The green book, yes. Uh, I didn't need to look at the movie because we lived it. Mm. And But we would go from New York to South Carolina, which is our roots. And by the way, the Gordines came in the country by the way of South Carolina, escaping religious persecution with the French Huguenots. But that's another story for <laughs> another day. Um, we would leave our back door open so the neighbors could come in and check, say, if the pipes would freeze. Uh, it right. was... And that, I think all the neighbors right. knew we were gone. Nowadays, you can't even tell yourself you're leaving town. That's true. Right. Now, now Truxton has been recognized mm -hmm. um, as a historic <clears throat> district. Yes. Tell me a little bit about what, what that means and how that, you know, when that came about. 1982. Was it, was it 80, 82, 79, I believe. 84? Yeah, here's 1982, and here's the actual application to the National Registry of Historic Places. <clears throat> that the city of Portsmouth and the Truxton Civic League got together and applied for to get that designation. But uh, you asked me earlier why I was so fascinated about the history of Truxton. Right. But to listen to Miss Gerdine <laughs> talk about the type of people that was in that neighborhood, I go back to how did we get that caliber of people in that neighborhood and from who? Because remember, Truxton was, came about just 50 years after the emancipation. Right. So there were slaves that actually came into that area that became homeowners. These were people that were sons of slaves that came together to work in a good place like a Navy yard and to create a family and to produce kids like she's talking about. Can you imagine that? And these were all uneducated people that had children that became the most prominent people in the Absolutely. city of Portsmouth. That's fascinating to someone like me. And I, I got a question for Mr. Savage here. Mr. Savage, growing up in Truxton, where you had, where there was water and electricity, were there, were people jealous of when you said you came from Truxton? Because I would imagine not all um, African-American communities had all of the amenities that the Truxton community had. So I remember... <clears throat> With the exception of maybe a portion, uh, 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 with the exception of Lincolnsville, mm. Portsmouth was the only black community 
uh, in Portsmouth that had uh, electricity and uh, uh, sewer system. So that did generate a little bit of uh, animosity. I would, uh, I would imagine at times, so. uh, maybe not animosity, but community competition. You okay. Know? Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, so we would. Uh, in the other communities, in Brighton, for example, when the ice cream truck came through, uh, the ice cream truck, you know, was a uh, truck that came through to uh, clean or to clear an empty uh, uh, outdoor toilets. Uh, the kids would joke. Uh, each other about uh, hey the ice cream man is in your community uh, so uh, yeah there was uh, some I would say uh, pride although it may have, may have been false to an extent uh, but uh, there was that kind of uh, kind of joking uh, back and forth and kidding between youngsters and now, the, now as a young child what stores or businesses do you remember being in Truxton back in the 30s 40s what do you remember well there was Joe Johnson's restaurant uh, the Vikings had their restaurant uh, Talmadge Johnson had his grocery store um uh, Hop Singh, uh, <laughs> uh, Williams had his dry cleaning business. Uh, Joe Mitchell had his barber shop. Uh, Mr. Luter had what we call the drugstore. Uh, the uh, there was a Pender chain grocery store in Truxton at that time. Mr. Parker had the pool parlor. Wow, there were a lot of businesses, a lot more than that. And uh, uh, then, of course, uh, there were uh, Mr. Hughes had Fish Market. And then the Skeeters came into uh, Truxton with their gift shop. So uh, those were the primary businesses that occupied the corner, as it used to be called. Yeah, Kenny, go ahead. Let me share something which he uh -huh. mentioned Brighton. This is a picture of the Truxton School that they built. Right. These people were so brilliant back at that time. I'm, I, you got to go back to the early 1900s. To look. This school had six classrooms. They only needed two to educate the children in Truxton. They <clears> rented <throat> the other four to the city of Portsmouth because Brighton School had overcrowding. So the city of Portsmouth was paying the town of Truxton rent for the school. These same people, Lisa, in, in 1921, had created a homeowners association. They taxed themselves to be able to run the town. Here's if you got thirty seconds. You I have could, thirty seconds. This is the re <laughs> look. This is the regular monthly meeting of the property owners association was held on June the seventh in nineteen twenty one. Mm -hmm. Okay, and they talked about all of the officers and who did what, and then at the end they gave a financial report. And they showed that they had a collection of a total of $827.62. Their expenditures were for the street lights, they paid $31.17. They paid $28 for printing. The water bill for the school was $11.06. The school supplies cost them $3.50. The police officer, the policeman made $150. The bookkeeper made $75. The janitor made $17.75. The principal made $110. Two teachers made $65 for a total of $130. And then there were two other teachers that were paid $55 for $110. So for a total of $796. This is a homeowners association in 1921. All black folk that none were educated 
and they brought in educated folks that helped them, and they put together a town, they put together a community, and they were able to do all of these things and then produce children like Mr. Savage and Miss Gardine and folks like that. That now, is amazing. It is amazing. The fire fire firefighters and, and police officers, were they coming from the city of Chess from the city of Portsmouth or were they coming from were they? Oh, no, no, no. They were self-contained. They had everything okay. in trucks. It wasn't until 1923 when the city of Portsmouth annexed the town that they took over those services and they sold the actual property to those three black gentlemen that, that bought the 250 homes. But up to that point, they were self-sustaining. And so this first black town manager... Mr. McCracken got together with Mr. Savage's grandfather and those community leaders, and they actually established a town council, and they set all of this up. They opened up a library, the grand opening of the library. The first day, they had 300 books. They raised money. If you look, he talked about all the organizations that he remembered as a kid. They had the lodges, the mothers' club, the patrons' club. They had look. Here's the 30th anniversary. They had a Miss Truxton pageant. All right. These are <laughs> ten, ten young black girls that were competing in 1949, the 30th wow. anniversary, <laughs> to become Miss Truxton. It's. I mean. Imagine that all of that went on in this small town. <laughs> and so you take all of that and then you try to pull it into today's environment and you go, there were things went on there. And even the federal government recognized this housing complex, this community that was created in 1919, once they killed that after the war, was not replicated until the 1960s. So a Cavalier Manor type neighborhood showed up in the late 50s or 60s. But what they did in Truxton, what the federal government and all of them did with this planned community, everything self-sustaining was squashed because of racism and all of those types of things. And it was 30 years later before you saw towns like Truxton popping up over the country. That's fascinating. That is very fascinating. May I add a little something to what? I like to call Mayor Kenny, uh, <laughs> mentioned the houses in Truxton are still standing. Right. The houses in Truxton, uh, you n- rarely ever, and I don't want to jinx it, you hear about fires over there. I, I still live in Truxton um, in a newer house, but I still have a couple of, of the original houses. The hardwood and the baseboard, even the walls are phenomenal. Um so when you talk about history, history lives right there in Truxton. Mm-hmm. Um, the houses are identical on the inside. It's just the facades that are placed on there in a different way, just to give it a little uh, distinction among the houses itself. And now, some of the wallboards you have to, they're called English wood. And the um, wood store on downtown, you can get this old German would to match the siding. What, now the historic. Now that it became a historic district, they have right. to. Anyone that moves into one of those homes has to keep it to comply with the uh, dictates of right. the uh, yeah, the windows. The regulations. And, uh, uh, trust guidelines. me, I've guidelines. been down to the <laughs> historical. <laughs> Just to make sure it was right, huh? <laughs> well, yeah, putting yeah. a porch on the back of one of the old houses. Um, and I call it the old house. But they're sturdy, and I wouldn't trade them for anything that's on the market today. Yeah. Well okay. built homes. We only have about six minutes left in the conversation, but I'd like to hear either from you all your, your fondest memory of the community while we still have a little bit of time or um, just something that we, we have missed about trucks and that you'd like people to know. Well, I'm gonna start oh, yeah. with, one of my fondest memories is how we supported each other when when somebody graduated, yeah. everybody was there. It wasn't like it is now where you have to have an invitation. When somebody on the street graduated, everybody on the street came in. And, and I must say this as, as well: uh, we had a, a area, even though we were separate communities, we had an area where we had a uh, highs ice cream, we had a uh, roses, we had a uh, uh, Irwin's pharmacy where the white and the black neighborhood had to share had to share that even though they were separate we had to come together during that period and and share that that uh that common ground and it was kind of unusual for that time because you just didn't mix like that 
but uh, that was that was a kind of unique uh, part of of Truxton and Holland Bitmore, I think it was. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And you have a- well, Christmas. Christmas was just magical. Oh. All of the all of the houses were lit up. The, the big star. Yeah, the uh, blue star on Portsmouth. There was a family that had at least a ten foot blue star on the yard, and five o'clock in the morning you could see the houses coming up because the children were going under the trees getting their gifts the easter we celebrated it religiously we honored with the new clothes um but there was a sense of religious pride spiritual pride um the education coach savage mentioned his mother insisting that he go to college that was the progression you had elementary school, you had junior high, you had high school, and college was just the next step. It wasn't the stressful, it was just the next step. And the memories, I could be here all night. Yeah, so. I was excited. Well, we only got four G- minutes. So. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Savage, do you have a, uh, something you'd like uh, to share before, before we run out of time? And, uh, you mentioned Easter. Do you recall, uh, were you too young at the time, but... Uh, it, there used to be a ritual when everybody in Truxton, all of the young people in Truxton on Easter Monday would walk down Deep Creek Boulevard to Deep Easter Creek uh, to the park you know, uh, uh, for an Easter outing. That's right. And remember the skating rink on Deep Creek Boulevard Heard where it. the old... Uh, the old apartment building had been torn down and the foundation mm. was left there. You remember? Yes, when, yes, I do. I got hurt out there. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he remembers it. <laughs> oh, that, that was a sacred place almost. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Lisa, let me, real quick a story. Mr. Yeah. John Kerry was a longtime principal. I at remember the hearing School. my mother. Well, he was Mr. there Kerry. for about 40 years. Mm-hmm. Well, I interviewed Mr. Curry around 2001. I was doing a history of the school system in Portsmouth, and back then it was the black system and the white system. Well, Mr. Curry was one of the three top principals, him, Mr. S.H. Clark, and Mr. Weaver. Well, anyway, talking to Mr. Curry, he talked about the variety shows, and you mentioned that earlier in your open segment about the variety show. He was adamant about making sure the children in Truxton understood what was going on around the world. He made his teachers each year put on some type of event dealing with some other culture outside of Truxton and the United States. And I remember him sharing with me that back in the 60s, he took a group of school teachers to Cuba Mm-hmm. And it was the talk of the town that this black principal with these black school teachers went all the way to Cuba. He wanted them to see, and he he joked about Castro wasn't in power at that time. He said Castro was still up in the woods. Batiste was in charge, and during that era, he took those teachers to Cuba just because he wanted them to experience and see how others lived, and then they brought that back, and they had shows, and the kids created costumes and all of that, and whether it was Chinese, Indian, and and I and I remember him talking about those variety shows, and he took pride when he was telling me that. So I don't know who the originator of the variety shows, maybe it was mm. Mr. Curry, <laughs> yeah. but uh, uh, that was fascinating to be able to educate those kids about how other people live around the world. And okay. my mother was we, a seamstress for a lot of those costumes. We have about 30 seconds left, and I want James to run through some of the things that are going to be happening okay, for this uh, 100th celebration. <laughs> In Re- real quick, it's going to be a ride. Uh, starting on May 16th, that's a Thursday, uh, through May 19th, Sunday, it's going to be a lot of activities, a whole weekend. Uh, mainly, I mentioned this, so uh, Friday night at uh, Edmond Center, there will be a awards banquet. And uh, tickets are still available until Monday, and that's the cutoff date for that, that uh, affair. Okay, so, I'm gonna we're gonna try to get back yeah. to it so we can name some more things. But sure. there is a Facebook page um, that people can go to um, for um, to find out more information about Truxton 100. But unfortunately, we are out of time, and sure. we will be right back. <laughs> Ooh, 
Hi, I'm Claude McKnight of the group Take Six, and you're listening to Another View. As part of the commemoration American Evolution, the Virginia Arts Festival has commissioned a new ballet and performing this world premiere is none other than the talented men and women who make up the Dance Theater of Harlem. The ballet was created by award-winning choreographer Claudia Schreier, who stopped by earlier this week to share with us a little about herself and this new work titled Passage. I've been dancing almost my entire life. I started dancing at three years old, choreographing when I was about 12 or 13. And I managed somehow to make a career out of it, which has been my lifelong dream. And Claudia Schreier does it well. She's choreographed more than two dozen ballets and been commissioned at least a dozen times by companies like the American Ballet Theater, the Ailey School, and the Vail Dance Festival. Her latest work is not only a collaboration between American Evolution and the Virginia Arts Festival, but between Schreier and music composer Jesse Montgomery, who created the original score for the ballet titled Passage. She and I aligned artistically immediately, and I was really drawn to her work. It made sense in a lot of ways because I am a woman of color creating ballet. Jessie is a woman of color looking to expand her music in new ways. We're creating work for this historic black dance company that has transformed American ballet and ballet across the world, truly. And so merely by existing and being able to say that we are creating this this product, this project together, um, it, it is kind of the, the tip of the iceberg in terms of what it represents historically. The events that occurred in 1619 profoundly shaped the nation. From the meeting of the first legislative assembly to the arrival of the first Africans in English-speaking North America. We never wanted to create a work that explicitly reflected the um, historical events of the commemoration. I think that's, that's very heavy and no one can really ever encompass that fully. But to be able to draw upon the themes that have taken us to where we are today became our kind of North Star for, for doing this. Passage will be performed by 12 dancers from the company, six women and six men, all dancing to a musical score that will be performed by Jessie Montgomery and her quartet, aided by additional musicians from Norfolk. The world premiere of Passage begins tonight, May 3rd, and runs through May 5th at Norfolk's Chrysler Hall. Well, I can't wait to see it this weekend. I'd also like to say congratulations and happy anniversary to the Dance Theater of Harlem. The company turns 50 years old this year. And if you are interested in being a part of this 100th anniversary celebration that's going on for the Truxton community, there is a place you can go, James. Yes, uh, on the Facebook page, Historical Truxton Civic League. Uh, go to their page, and, and from May 16th to the 19th, ending in a church service, appropriately. So just go to that page, and you'll get a list of all the activities through that weekend. It's an ongoing process. Thank you so much. And thank you for spending your noonday hour with us. If you'd like to hear this show again or share it with a friend, please visit our website at anotherviewradio.org, and you can download the podcast. While you're there, please sign up for our eView newsletter, a once a week reminder of our upcoming programs. We're on Facebook, so please like us. And I'm on Twitter at Godly, that's G-O-D-L-E-Y underscore Lisa. Next week, it's the Another View Roundtable. The ladies will be in the house tackling the topics that are making headlines. Thank you so much for joining us today. Our theme music composed by Jay Sennett. I want to thank Jonah Grinkowitz for producing for me. And thank you, Jimmy Cooper, for answering our phones. Have a wonderful day. 